All right. Uh, I, I assume everyone can hear me. It's quite loud. Um, thank you all for coming. Uh, first, I think it's almost customary. I want to thank Filmon and Thibault for organizing it, and as well as uh, Alessandra, who I got in touch with already last year. And um, I think I'll jump right in. I did some R&D over the week, and I came out of, at about 25 minutes. So if it's 35, I'm going to be very, <laughs> very happy. Um, this is going to be the outline. I'm going to tell you what field theories are, especially classical field theories. Um, I'm going to talk to you about quantum field theories, what it means when we quantize a field theory, what matrix elements are and why it's important for us to calculate them. And then I want, uh, I think, three and four, you can see this as kind of a, one big topic. Um, I want to go a bit into the standard model and especially before we look at the full standard model at two uh, of the three forces that show up in the standard model, the electromagnetic and the strong force, which we, uh, after quantizing, call quantum electrodynamics and quantum chromodynamics. And then I will also uh, mention one kind of big feature or difference that these two forces have. Um, I, I guess the, mainly the reason why we call the strong force the strong force. What does it mean for a force to be strong? Um, so this, I think this is, uh, when you do talks like this, usually one starts with kind of the Greeks, I guess, and then you do 2,000 years of philosophy about what elementary means and what is the smallest thing that we can have. I'm going to skip all that and just tell you that this talk will be about s things that are very small. Um, we usually, the, the, when you start studying physics, you first learn about things that happen, I guess I can call it, at the human scale, at about a meter, you learn about classical mechanics, how do things uh, with a mass move. Um, maybe sometime later, I think this isn't then only the physicists, not really the mathematicians, unless you choose to do it, um, you uh, realize that if we go uh, far below the human scale in terms of size, about 10 to the minus 10 meters, um, classical mechanics doesn't really work out anymore, and we have to come up with something new, which uh, we called quantum mechanics. And this was about, I think, 100 years ago, you know, the roaring 20s uh, with Heisenberg and Schrödinger and all of those people. And then uh, if, you, uh, if you go to even smaller scales, say um, uh, quarks, these are the particles that make up what protons and neutrons are in the atomic nucleus, they're really what you have to use to describe those kinds of processes is uh, quantum field theory. And um, another way to see this is, I think it's called the Bronstein cube. This is also something most lecturers show in their first lecture about quantum field theory. Um, you can kind of, uh, if you want, uh, draw physics a as this little cube where here you have a s sort of measure on how relativistic things are. Here you have a measure on how quantum things are. And then here you have um, how much does gravity play into it. And then you see that we start off at, with classical mechanics, and then if we, uh, if we make things relativistic, we end up with the special relativity, theory of special relativity. Um, if we make things quantum, we end up with quantum mechanics. And quantum field theory is, in fact, kind of what happens if we make things quantum, but we also make things relativistic. Um, this, I, I put this for completion, I mean, I could have just drawn like the, the back part of this for completion. I put in all of the uh, gravity stuff as well, as well as the theory of everything here, which we have no idea what that is. Um, but uh, yeah, so this is kind of um, also a way to see it. Now, uh, starting with the actual talk, um, classical mechanics, uh, I don't know um, uh, how familiar you are with this, um, what's important is that if we talk about some mass point that is governed by classical mechanics, we usually characterize this by a pair M and L. M is some subset of what we call a configuration space. Um, for example, if we have a particle moving in this room at some mass point, then this configuration space would just be R3. Well, it would not be exactly R3, it would be R3, but then you would put some boundaries in, because if I have some ball, it probably can't escape the walls there. 
So this is why in this case M would be this room, R3 would be, you know, all of, all of space, right? And uh, the second thing that we need to describe this point moving is something that we call the Lagrange function. And the Lagrange function is conventionally defined as the kinetic energy minus the potential energy. And it turns out that if we know this Lagrange function, the equations of motion can be written in terms of, these, of, of this Lagrange function. So in a sense, what I want you to take away from this is we need to know the Lagrange function, and then we know how things move, right? So put, if we can solve the equations of motion, right? But this is another topic, right? I'm just talking about theoretically, we can write down what governs a particle moving if we know this Lagrange function, and we know the configuration space that our particle is moving in. And so, in a way, is if we have some time interval, we can, with using these equations of motion, then describe how this particle moves in this configuration space. Right? So if you think of M here as this room, then we can let, let a free particle move through this room, and this will describe some curve. I call it Q of t. You can also call it X of t with a vector. Um, and, and this describes the motion of, of the particle. Right? Fields are very much similar, but there's one important difference. Now, a classical field is something that takes each point in space and time, a time point and a space time, uh, and a space point, and it gives it a value in what we call the field space. The field space can be a lot of things. It can also be r to the power of three, but it can also be the complex plane, it can be any vector space, it can even be a manifold. And the analogy that I want you to kind of take away with is field theory is a bit like classical mechanics, but instead of only, say, three degrees of freedom here in this room, we have infinitely many. So there's an analogy that you can make. This, this um, motion Q alpha of T now becomes some field phi alpha of T and X where in a way, instead of describing it with respect to some time, we describe it with respect to a time and a point in space, right? So a field would not be a ball moving around this room, but it would be something that's spread throughout this room, and at every time, I have to tell you what the value is at every point in space of this field. And the nice thing is that for fields, we can still def like define this Lagrangian, and then we can still define how these behave with the Euler-Lagrange equations, or we can still find these equations of motion. And the way that we, uh, um, the, what we use with fields is something that we call the Lagrangian density. Now, the Lagrange function is kinetic energy minus potential energy. And this is a function of Q and of T. But now we also have space in there. So now we can't really formulate it in terms of just the time anymore. So what we do is we say, OK, the Lagrange function that we know from earlier has to be the Lagrangian density if we keep time fixed and integrate all over space. So now, instead of formulating a Lagrange function at some time t, we formulate a density that is, again, takes up a value at every point in the space time. And then for this density, we can also formulate our little Lagrange equations. And so I drew the picture here again. Earlier, we had this thing where we have some time interval, and then we formulate a curve. Now we have some, say, subset of space-time that I call G. And then in this subset, we might have a point x. And then we can, uh, this field uh, uh, gives it a value phi of x. And we can then see how, how, how this thing evolves in time, right? If you checked out now, the only thing I want you to take away from this is that this Lagrangian density up here is really what we need to know to know how our fields behave. This is the one thing that I want you to take away with. Now, this was very abstract. There's one classical field theory that I think everyone knows in this room, and it is light. Light was probably the first classical field theory. Um, I think uh, Faraday and then later Maxwell were, the, were kind of the first pioneers. Uh, electromagnetism in general, what, like the first big kind of leap in that, in that direction was Maxwell saying, well, if, there, if you have two magnets and they attract each other, there really is something in between them, right? We, can, we can't see this, but there is some field 
that is spread throughout all of space, and then the light or this magnetic force is really just ripples in this field. It's light as some waves of this field. Um, and so now, th this is kind of, a, uh, again, this, this, this feature will, I, I will repeat this a million times. The field is spread throughout phase, th this field is spread throughout space, and then what we uh, see as light are these, these waves and ripples in this field. Now, what happens when we quantize? This could be a lecture on its own, and it's not going to be. <laughs> So I'm just going to tell you one punchline of quantum mechanics, and then I'm going to hopefully give you the big picture of what quantum field theory is. Now, quantum mechanics tells us that things should be discrete. Um, one example is that energy always comes in packets, um, or discrete lumps, that we call quanta. They're the name quantum mechanics is from. For example, something like, a, 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 a more, like a harmonic oscillator, you know, a pendulum, if you look at this as a quantum system, it tells you that the energy has to come in discrete steps. And now the question that we have to ask is, what happens when we combine this idea of discreteness with this idea of a field which is sort of something spread throughout, it's very continuous, it's, it's, not, it's not discrete at all, right? And what we, what we get out of that really is quantum field theory. Now there's also a quantum field theory that you guys all know, and it's light, right? I think uh, early in the 20th century, uh, what kind of, uh, what uh, uh, um, I, people, pioneers like Einstein with the photoelectric effect, what they realized or started to realize is that light waves actually correspond to little photons. These photons are particles of light. These, these light waves, if you look at them in a, a very, 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 uh, on a very small scale, they get bundled up by quantum mechanics into packets of energy, and these then make up the photons. I think this is everyone, like a lot of people learn this in school still, this, this thing of light can be a wave, but it also can be a particle. This really is a quantum field theory that you guys, I think, all know. Um, now, kind of the, the big idea of quantum field theory is this does not only apply to light, in fact, this applies to all the particles that we have in the universe, all the elementary particles. So all the particles that can't be uh, um, broken up into something else. For example, there is an electron field spread throughout the universe, and the waves of this electron field get bundled up into little bunches by quantum mechanics, and then what we get is an electron, right? And I think this is, this is if they want you to take away one thing from this talk, it's this. That, these, uh, that, that really the, the key is this, these ripples and excitations of this field that is everywhere around us, and then it gets bundled up, and this is what we see as particles. Oh, and it turns out that we do not, do not only have the electron and the photon, but we have about a lot of them, right? And so these are currently all of the elementary particles that we have. So for each of those, there is some field. And whenever we see a particle here, say an electron, it means that there is some excitation of this field or some ripple in this field that gets bundled up and makes this electron. Um, now, I don't want you to understand what all of these do. We're going to go into a bit of detail in a second. This is just the first time I flashed this. I will show this like eight more times. Now, to be a bit more rigorous, this field phi of x that I looked at earlier, in, when we quantize, it becomes a field operator. Those who know functional analysis will know what I mean. Those who don't know, you don't have to care what an operator is, right? The important thing is with an operator, we can act on something. And in this case, um, we not only get an, uh, um, maybe I should have said operators, because for each field we get a creation and an annihilation operator, and these operators do exactly what their name is. We can create and annihilate particles with them. So the electron field, after quantizing, becomes an electron field, we, give an, we get an electron field creation and an electron field annihilation operator. And then if we take the vacuum, where nothing's in there, and we act with this creation operator on the vacuum, we get an electron. 
And it turns out that um, if we act with different field operators of, of the same type, so say with two electron creation operators, but just at different points in space-time, we create or annihilate the same particle. Which is, I mean, I, this is kind of just a, a different way to set what I said two minutes ago, which tells us that everywhere in the universe, an electron here is exactly the same electron as an electron somewhere. I mean, it's not the same, but it will have the same mass, it will have the same charge. The, 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 the properties that it has, these are all the same. These are here, the same here on Earth, and the same in some galaxy millions of light years away. Because both of these electrons, here and millions of light years away, are excitations or ripples of the same underlying electron field. Yes? So what is the difference between the operators performed phi x and phi y? So the difference is that phi x, say if this is a creation operator, phi x creates a particle at point x in space-time, and phi y creates a particle at point y in space-time. So this is what I mean with same type, but different, right? Same type means it's the same phi, but we... For each, in, in a sense, when we quantize, we get operators for each point in space, because at each point we could theoretically create some particle. Now we distinguish between two particles, uh, or two types of particles, and now I will, from now on I will always say particles slash fields, because we just learned that they are sort of the same thing. Um, we distinguish between fermions and bosons. For fermions, the field space is C4, and it turns out that fermions always come with an antiparticle. And the antiparticle has the same mass, but opposite charge. One example would be that the electron always comes, I mean, if we quantize the electron field, we also have the positron field, which is the electron with the same mass, but opposite charge, a positively charged electron, so to speak. And so each, the particle and the antiparticle come with creation and annihilation operators. And for those who know what spin is, they have half integer spin. For those who don't know what spin is, forget what I just said. Um, so if the fermions in the, in the standard model are here. These are the fermions. The fermions are classed in quarks and leptons, and then there's even subclasses of them. Um, so here, these, these are the particles with field space C4, and it turns out that for each of them, we also have an antiparticle. For the electron, we have the positron. For the up quark, we have the anti-up. We, we didn't really, we we're not really uh, good with names. I think the electron is the only one that has an, an extra name that's not just anti and then the particle. Um, the neutrinos are a bit of a st uh, different story. Um, they might be their own antiparticle, they might not, but this is something that I won't go into this at, at, this, at, at, at this point. If you want, you can ask me questions about, about that. Now, you see already that there is a second type of particle here, a boson. So, what are the bosons? The bosons are related to a force as well as to a symmetry and a charge. Those people who know what Noether's theorem is know that the name charge and symmetry is sort of the same thing. Those who don't, they have a charge and a symmetry. Um, they also call them force carriers over here. And that is because the bosons are particles that mediate between forces. We have four fundamental forces, gravity, the weak force, the strong force, and the uh, electromagnetic force. And it turns out gravity is not in here. <laughs> That's one thing I have to say. And the second part, for all the three other forces, you have associated bosons. For the strong force, we have the gluons. For the electromagnetic force, we have the photons. These you've already seen. And then for the weak force, we have the W and the Z bosons. The Higgs is a different story. I will hopefully come to that later. Now, there's two types. The first, the field space depends on the type, and then there's two types. There's something we call vector bosons, which come with an index of space-time, so they have like a vector in space. They have three different directions, or in that sense, four. And uh, scalar boson bosons do not. And for those who know what spin is, they have integer spin. Now, we know how to create and annihilate particles. So now we kind of want to, do, uh, want to look at what we can do with them. And usually, what kind of the bread and butter of quantum field th theorists, at least 
the people who do more phenomenology is, um, is uh, what, what we call ca calculating matrix elements. And matrix elements are something that describes the following process. First, we have, oh, I accidentally. First, we have n incoming part particles with some form momentum. So these particles come in, something happens to them. This can be one interaction or many interactions. And then we have m outgoing particles, again, with some different form momentum. The really interesting, or the thing that you have to take to keep in mind here is that a process like this is not necessarily a process like in classical mechanics. If we, if we take two tennis balls and we throw them in somewhere, they can only ever scatter, but whatever comes out of that is two tennis balls. Quantum field theory allows us to create and annihilate particles, so it can be that whatever comes out here is not the same particles that what comes, comes in here, right? There could be some kind of decay, there could be two particles creating another one, Really, the, this, uh, this blob that I drew here in the middle that represents something happens, this can be a lot, and not just particles bouncing off each other. Yes? Yes, so momentum is conserved. Um, and, uh, uh, but it's, uh, so in the end, actually, the, this is if you do the mathematics, in the end, you, you, you force it to be conserved by uh, multiplying with a delta function um, or a delta distribution that um, uh, uh, ensures that uh, the incoming momenta are the same as the outcoming for, for momenta. So you sum them up. The sum of the incoming momenta has to be the same as the sum of the outcoming ones. Um, and what we want to do is we want to calculate the probability that such a process happens. Um, and it turns out um, that if we want to do that, we have to consider everything that can happen in here. Right? And sum them up in, an, in the right way. Um, and to do that, we go back to what I told you in the first 10 minutes. We need this Lagrangian density L. So really, what quantum field theory now becomes, at least for the rest of the talk, is finding this right, the right Lagrangian density that describes really the type of interaction that we want to look at. In this case, for example, the electromagnetic interaction or the strong interaction. We can ask, what type of Lagrangian do we need to, what type of terms do we need to have in this Lagrangian density so that we can have these types of processes happening? And this uh, brings me to kind of the, the third part. Um, this will be slightly more technical, but after that will be less technical again. So strap in for maybe two or three minutes and then hopefully it'll be over quick. Um, there are some general principles when we want to build a Lagrangian densities. First, if we encounter some symmetries in nature, for example, in experiment, or even if we want to impose some symmetries because we believe that nature is like this, the Lagrangian densities has to respect all of those. One example is Lorentz symmetry or the symmetry of special relativity. Uh, another way of saying Lorentz symmetry means that whatever process we look at, if we calculate it, calculate the, uh, this process with the Lagrangian density, we should get, get the same result if we do it here or in some other inertial system, say on the moon. Right? The process itself should not change and the probability should not change. Otherwise, something's wrong. Um, and what, what else do we need? Uh, we need information about the properties of the particles, such as the mass and the spin. And it needs to tell us, I mean, this is kind of obvious, about all the possible ways that a particle or a field can interact with another. Um, this is kind of the big three uh, uh, um, principles that we, we want to follow. And when building this Lagrangian density for quantum field theory, what we start with usually is what we call the free theory. The free theory is a theory where no interactions happen. So we don't have any interaction terms. We have just free particles moving around in space-time and they can't interact at all. That doesn't mean that there's nothing in the Lagrangian density, because even to describe how these, particles just move, moves around, move, how these particles just move around, you still need information about something like the mass, right? So usually, um, or I mean, I'm saying usually, but it definitely has to, the Lagrangian density has to contain what we call a kinetic term 
which tells us about how the particle behaves if there's no interactions. And the kinetic term, therefore, has to contain information such as the mass. Now, this is the part where it gets a bit iffy. <laughs> this is the Lagrangian density for free fermions. And hopefully this not, doesn't scare you too much. I'm going to go slightly into what, what we have here. So first off, what we see is, if you remember, fermions have the field space C4. So this fermion psi here is a C4 vector. So what you can already see is that we have some type of matrix multiplication here. We sum from i, j going 1 to 4. And then we have some psi bar i, which is defined via the, um, I, I will have to say, physicists usually don't call bar the complex conjugation. They actually call it a mix of Hermitian conjugation and multiplication with a 4 by 4 matrix. But for the better part of, of the talk, you can just think of psi bar, wait, maybe I can, you can think of psi bar being something like, Psi 2, Psi 3, Psi 4, right? So we take the vector and we transpose it, more or less, right? So we have this Psi bar here. Then we have, if you concentrate on the right first, we have some mass times the 4 by 4 identity matrix, and then we have Psi again. So in the end, we should get a scalar. Now there's another matrix here that includes these gamma mu's, and the derivatives, the only thing I want to say about this is that gamma mu are some specific set of 4 by 4 matrices. They um, have to uh, uh, fulfill a very, uh, uh, a very specific relation. Um, I'm not going, to, if you ask me afterwards, I can tell you what it is, but, um, um, but I, uh, I will not say it right now. So important is we have something like a transpose here, we have some matrix multiplication, and then we have the vector here. And in this Lagrangian, we have a term that tells us about the mass. Yes? Oh, yeah, the i is the imaginary unit. So I sh maybe I shouldn't have, shouldn't have used i. And then in physics, we have uh, these little nice things here. We call them Feynman diagrams. And there's, a very, there's actually a very nice connection between those and, uh, and, and the actual mathematics behind the theory, but I'm not going to go into that. I will, the only thing I will say is that we use these little Feynman diagrams. Oh. Uh, we use these little Feynman diagrams uh, to represent some particle moving around. Right? In this case, we have some psi moving around. Here, when we draw this, we have some psi bar moving around. The arrow here is inverted because uh, it turns out that the psi bar has opposite charge as the psi. It's not directly related to the antiparticle. It can be. This is, so this is the only reason why we have two different things here. Um, now, we seem to have a lot of indices. So the first thing I want to do, because I get a confused a lot with those types of things, is I want to make things a bit more clean. So what I do is first, I just define, um, define this product here, gamma mu, del mu. The del mu are derivatives. I think you all know from, from physics one, you know the, the Nabla operator, right? This, this product here, gamma mu, del mu, is sort of like the Nabla operator, only that it's a four by four matrix. And you have derivatives in there. Um, so the first thing I do is I take this and I just say, OK, uh, O slash, or in this case, del slash is just this product, because I want to get rid of it. Or, uh, it's just the sum of these products, because I want to get rid of it. And the second thing I do is I make the matrix multiplication implicit. So I, I don't write this anymore. I just write something like this. So now it looks a lot better, <laughs> to me at least. And in a second, it will also become clear well, why, why this is a nice form to just look at how, what kind of interactions we can have in the theory. Um, now, what if we add a force to the picture? We want to add electromagnetism. I said earlier that the force is related to a symmetry, or the boson, in this case the photon, um, is related to a force, a symmetry, and a charge. So by extension, the force is also related to a boson and a symmetry and a charge, right? These are all... Uh, the different words for the same thing, sort of. And in this case, what we have is we have a, something called a U1 symmetry, which means that we can multiply this field psi by some complex number with, uh, abs with uh, um, mod squared 1, and the Lagrangian should not change. And it's also related to a boson, the force, 
And in this case, the boson is, so has some value in R. It's a vector boson, so it comes with an indice, a space-time indice here. Um, uh, yeah, it's, it's some value in R. The charge it, uh, it is related to is what we call the electric charge Q. And if we want to add the interaction, what we do is we take the Lagrangian and we add a term like this. What you find in here is first the elementary charge. You find the charge Q of the particle. Sort of Q is a way, uh, uh, in a way, Q is in that, in that sense in terms of the elementary charge. Um, and then you find this photon A. It comes with a slash. So one example is if we want, if, we, if this fermion here is an electron, then Q would be equal to 1, right? Because an electron has elementary charge 1. So really, how this, this term here depends, at least with respect to this Q, on what type of fermion you have interacting with the photon or interacting electromagnetically. Now, the photon is a particle, so we need a kinetic term for it. Because we not only want to have some interaction between the, an electron and the photon, but we also want the, to, the photon to be able to just move around without interacting with anything. And it turns out, and I'm, uh, I know I'm being, a, I'm being a weasel, because I'm not going to tell you why this is the case. If you ask me afterwards, I'd love to talk about this. Um, it, it turns out that it is related, the kinetic term is related to something called, we call the field strength tensor. Um, you can just think of this as some object that combines derivatives of this A. And then if we add it in this way in the right, I take a sum over mu and nu here implicitly. Um, then we get the kinetic term for the photon. And if you checked out for the last 10 minutes, I have these little nice diagrams here. What we now have, if we have a Lagrangian like this, is we can have fermions moving around in space. We can have a photon moving around in space. And because of this term, you see a psi bar, an A, and a psi. We can also have some interaction like this. Here, we have a psi. Here, we have an A. And here, we have a psi bar. So we really draw this diagram by looking at, oh, we have a term in the Lagrangian like this. So this interaction here is possible. And this is why these diagrams are nice. And in fact, if you really, if you do like quantum field theory of Feynman diagrams in a sort of rigorous way, it turns out that this really represents uh, a, a, an actual a, a mathematical um, um, object that's behind, that describes this interaction. Um, now we have made QED, and we can try again the same thing with another force, which is the strong force. So I'm going to go over this a bit quicker, but it's not, this part is not really important. I put it in there for completion. We do the same thing as just now. We start with three fermions, and we add another force. But in this case, um, the force is not related to a U1 symmetry, which is mod of the, a complex number with uh, mod squared 1. In this case, it's related to the multiplication with a matrix SU3, a matrix in SU3, which are the 3x3 three three matrices that are um, uh, um, that uh, x uh, uh, Hermitian times x uh, um, equals the identity. And in this case, the boson that's related to this is the gluon, and the gluon is in this thing that I call SU3. People who know what Lie algebras are, this is the Lie algebra of, of big SU3. For people who don't, this is some vector space of other 3x3 three three matrices that have the property that they're anti-emission and their trace is zero. Trace being the sum over the um, diagonal elements. What's important is that this vector space here has dimension 8. So instead of just, I mean, R has dimension 1, right? The photon. In, in, because we now have dimension 8, we have 8 different gluons. And it turns out that this is somewhat related to this thing here. We also now have three associated charges that we call color. So things that interact with respect to the strong force come with something like a charge that we call color. The color charge is nothing different than the electric charge Q. I don't know why we call it color. But the, really, the leap that you have to make in your head is we have this electric charge Q, and we have some 
the color charge is in a sense the same way, the same thing as the electric charge. It kind of depends. It tells us how does this thing that carries this color charge interact with the gluons. Um, the Lagrangian becomes something like this. I now wrote uh, um, this G in terms of the basis elements of, of, of this vector space. And we can again add a, a, add a kinetic term because the gluons are particles. And in this case, the kinetic term, so if you checked out now, you can check back in. In this case, the kinetic term has some extra thing here that's related to something that we call the structure constants, which are just constants depending on, on these uh, A, B, and C, which go from 1 to 8, and then two of, these, uh, of, of the gluons here. And so if we add this term in the same way again, what we get is, again, interactions. We get, as we just had now, we, have, we get free particles moving around. We now have the gluon, which we write in this little spiral. We again have this interaction here, psi bar, some gluon psi, so we have something like this. But now, because we have this extra term here, we can also have three gluons and four gluons coming together and interacting. And so this is the big difference between quantum electrodynamics the uh, uh, electromagnetic force and the strong force is that in the electromagnetic force, we cannot have two photons interacting. You cannot scatter photons off of each other or something. But in the strong force, the gluons, they can, in fact, interact with each other. And this has a, this is one, this is kind of the last point I'll make. This has a very important implication uh, in how this force reacts. Now, I just I told you about this elementary charge, and maybe I forgot to mention uh, this thing G, which is, in fact, not a gluon, but this is the, what we call the strong coupling constant. So it's sort of like the elementary charge, but for, for the strong interaction. It tells us how strong is the strong interaction. Um, and it turns out that these, this elementary charge and this is not a fixed quantity. I think most people think that the elementary charge, you know, it's some constant. It's related to the fine structure constant. It has some value, one point something. Um, it turns out that this elementary charge actually depends on uh, the energy scale at, what, at, at which the interaction happens. And usually we re uh, um, the way we write this is in terms of this alpha that I don't know why, that is given by the squared over 4 pi. We could just, I could also draw it with respect to E and G. Um, but what, 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 we, what we find is that depending on the energy at which some interaction happens, these, these, uh, um, these quantities in the Lagrangian actually change. And it turns out that for uh, the electromagnetic force, if we increase energy, the interaction becomes stronger. In a way, E becomes bigger, the interaction becomes stronger. In the, in the case of the strong force, if we increase energy, the interaction strength decreases. And if, if you actually, if you really understand why this is the case for the strong force, you're very close to winning a million dollars because this is very related to the, one of the Clay Millennium Prizes. Um, if you want to ask me, we can do that in the APRO. And so the implication this has is that we don't ever encounter free quarks in nature, because usually in nature, the energies that we're at are quite low. And at low energies, the strong force is very, very strong. This is why we call it the strong force. This G is very large. So the interaction is super strong, so the quarks really get held together. They can't escape each other. And this is uh, this thing that we, we call this, is, there's a buzzword for it that call, that's called asymptotic freedom. But really, the, the reason why we don't encounter free quarks in nature is, is, this, is this thing that I drew here. And this is the reason quarks from bound states, such as protons and neutrons. And they also don't decay, at least as far as we know, yeah? Um, yeah, so here... This is an energy of zero. Uh, um, usually, we, we, um, we, de we denote the energy in terms of what we call giga electron volt. Um, I think you, when you look at the CERN stuff, a lot of the times they say, oh, we now we have uh, an energy of 13 tera electron volt, right? So this is about zero giga electron volt. 
And then I, I will say this QD, it runs very, like, it increases very slowly. So um, at, for example, I think um, 90 mega electron volt, which is the mass of the, um, of the weak gauge bosons, this uh, goes from 1 over 137 to 1 over 128. So this is why, I mean, the, the electric the elementary charge is, it's not constant, but it's, you know. Uh, while here, this thing, this actually, we don't even know what value this takes close to zero because it really does go asymptotically, right? This explodes somewhere here, which is why we don't encounter the quarks freely in nature. Um, it's, I don't know if that's exactly your question, but I can, I can tell you, um, right after the Big Bang, we, there is something that physicists call the quark gluon plasma, and this is exactly what, what, what happens when this thing here decreases enough so that you don't form protons and neutrons in bound states. So when things are very hot, Th things move very fast, and then you have high energies. And that really, like th this quark gluon plasma, so right after the Big Bang would it be a situation in the universe where uh, this thing would have been very low. Also, in the LHC, um, uh, I said earlier, uh, um, at, the, at about the scale of the weak, weak uh, gauge bosons, the, this alpha for QED is 1 over 128. The alpha for QCD there is about 0 0.12. So there it's also lower. Um, but I, I, I can talk to you about that later because it's very interesting. Um, so, and then for QED, this is weak at low energy, which is why we do find free electrons. Right? Um, now, one in the last two minutes, something about the standard model. Um, I now talk to you about uh, the electromagnetic and the strong force. I alluded earlier that there's also the weak force, and there's a reason why I didn't go into this. Because while it's, very, while it's very, very interesting, it's also very complicated, and I did not find a way in how to put this in the talk. Um, but, yeah, so this is again for, for completion, the picture of the particles. So now we, we discuss the strong force, which essentially tells us a lot about how these quarks interact. Because it turns out that the quarks are the only particles that do have this color charge. The leptons here do not have any color charge. But don't uh, take this the wrong way. The quarks do, in fact, have an electric charge. So the quarks kind of interact with everything. The leptons, they, they only interact with, uh, we, with the weak and the, uh, and the electromagnetic force. Uh, and this is, so this is the full Lagrangian in a very condensed form. Uh, if you ever go to CERN, they have these t-shirts in the gift shop uh, where it's on. This is a very condensed form, so for this form I cannot really tell you what we just looked at. Um, so maybe we should expand it a bit. Um, this is the fully expanded form. <laughs> this might also be a bit too much. But I think a way to write it very nicely is this. And what we've now seen is the strong force. We've seen that this is here the kinetic term for the gluons. Here, in here, there's the kinetic terms for the electrons. We find, again, um, here these interactions. Now they even um, uh, condense the, uh, uh, the derivatives here in, in this big D. And so what we looked at is we looked at a part of this, a part of this, and also a part of this. This part here. This all is the Higgs. And the Higgs is also something that I didn't talk to you about, but I won't do, um, because I'm already 10 minutes over, over time, and I also didn't plan on talking about the Higgs. But if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. And just for completion, these little diagrams I showed you earlier, these are all the diagrams that we can get out of this. And the ones that we looked at are these. So you don't, have, you don't quite have half, but you do have a good chunk, at least out of of two of the three forces. And I guess there's no good way to end it. Um, the only thing I want to say is things are not complete. We have dark matter. We have something called matter antimatter asymmetry, which we also call CP violation. The neutrinos have masses, which they don't in the standard model. Uh, we have gravity. So we really know the standard model is not the final picture of things. And we need new ideas, but it is very good. 
Um, and with that, I want to thank you for the attention. Mm -hmm. You talk about a certain uh, game space that you have to consider. Um, is this the relationship, uh, is the safe space kind of also represented in the diagrams, or is this something that comes before? Does this specific to something, or is, is there some link? Uh, uh, what do you mean by state space? I mean in the slide of the thing in the I'm not mm. sure Mm -hmm. But uh, you said that you started a certain, like it sounds like a probabilistic object that you have some state space where you consider maybe all the possible interactions of uh, standard elements that you have. So I wanted to consider, like I wanted to ask where does the state space come from? Is there a connection, um, is there a connection to the diagram? Um, yeah, there, there is a connection to the diagram. So um, usually what we do is um, we, if we have some process, for example, uh, two electrons coming in. Then I drew this picture where we don't really know what's happening here. And what we want to do, if, if we want to calculate some probability of this happening, say if we have electrons outgoing, right? This, could, this is one of the... Uh, wait, this actually... I have to write this with a positron because of the rules. <laughs> So the, the example still stands. If we have an electron and a positron coming in, we have an electron and a positron coming out, um, what we really have to do to calculate the probability that this happens is we have to consider all of these diagrams that factor into it. Um, so we could, for example, have a photon. Uh, there could also be some weak interaction here. There could be something like, uh, like this. Right, where the photon itself creates an electron and a positron again, and then they an an annihilate again into this. And so really what we have to do is we have to, for, for each of these diagrams, there's a probability that this is what's ha what happens if we have this coming in and we measure this coming out. And so we sum over all of those to in the end have... So usually what we do is, I mean, like in, in the end, we want to kind of compare to experiment. So what we have is we know what's coming in, and hopefully the detectors at Atlas tell us what's going, coming out. And then we kind of have to figure out, you know. And the probability of, let's say, the left diagram coming in compared to the right one is then measured by some experiment, hopefully. Or you might have some idea from an experiment point of view, or then given by an additional assumption. Um, I mean, we, we can, um, if we, like, this is the thing, is if we assume that our theory is correct, that the standard model correctly describes this, then I can calculate this probability without any experimental input, okay. right? Um, but I mean, this is the, and, 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 and in a sense, this is then what we do, right? We compare it to experiment, and, and then if, if we get different results, then something should be changed about the theory, right? But um, I, I, will, I have some backup slides about this. Um, this is, I did something about path integrals in the backup slides. I don't, this is probably gonna confuse you even more, but it turns out that, um, the probability that something happens is related to this object, which is a functional integral, an integral over field configurations, and then you weigh them with, a, with an exponential that depends on the action, which is related to this Lagrangian density. So this is why the Lagrangian density tells us about, about the... Yeah. But I mean, if you want to discuss this later, I, I would love to. It's... In, or another way to say it, there's this S matrix, which this is why we call the matrix elements, that maps the out states to the in states. And then it turns out that mod S squared is related to the probability that this process happens. So we want to calculate this S matrix.